The reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. If you managed to join our previous online service, you may remember that we introduced uh, a theme that I sense is going to be a key message for us in 2021, which we've summed up with one simple word, rooted. You know, this week has not been a particularly easy one. We've seen some pretty awful scenes coming out of America, while here in the UK, although lockdown and social distancing and travel restrictions and the like have been part and parcel of our lives for some time now, I really do sense that this latest round of lockdown has kind of generated something of a spirit of despair in many of our communities. And I suggest, therefore, that actually this further highlights this call that we need to be a people who remain rooted in these challenging times. You know, it's a long time since I did my A-level geography at school, but I remember that when we did, we learned quite a lot about deforestation. And that's something that actually gets talked about quite a lot in our news now because of its impact on climate change. But when I was at school, we particularly were learning about the impact of deforestation on what is erosion. And in essence, what we were learning is that because the tree roots aren't there anymore, reaching deep down into the earth and essentially holding all the soil and the other parts of the ecosystem together the soil begins to wash away and the weaker plants begin to wash away and suddenly the land becomes barren and useless or sometimes it causes massive flooding in some of the lower regions because once upon a time that water was being retained by the ecosystems that existed higher up. And as I've thought about that and, and thought about it in relation to this theme rooted, I do wonder whether there is something in that image that we can perhaps reflect on. By remaining rooted, the trees were not only ensuring their own flourishing, they were holding the land together. Their rootedness creates a stability and life right through the ecosystem. And as God's people, I wonder what impact and influence God is calling us to have, not only in remaining strong in our own faith at the moment, but by bringing stability and hope to our communities and our networks, by, by reaching out our roots, so to speak, and doing what we can to hold things together. And a bit like those trees in the ecosystem that I learned about at school, we might not even realise that we're doing that. You know, much of that early deforestation happened in complete ignorance of the wider impact that it was going to have. It was only when the trees were gone that people began to realise the job that they'd been doing for centuries before. Now, I don't know how true that may or may not be of us, but I hope that it just brings a further element to inspire you to say that at the very least, this is a season in which we do need to stand firm and remain rooted in our faith, rooted in God's word, rooted in our relationships as God's people, rooted in Christ.
And thank you to those church groups who have already shared with us that you are beginning to explore this theme yourselves. And uh, I'd encourage you to do that if you find it helpful. And over the next few weeks, we'll try and offer you some more resources to help with that, either through our website or through our YouTube channel. And we began to explore this theme of being rooted through a story that Jesus tells in the two Gospels, which I hope wasn't too much of a mixing of metaphors because, of course, we approach the theme from the perspective of two builders needing to ensure that there was a firm foundation. And our reading this week from 2 Peter carries that idea forward as we again are introduced to the image of a building as a way of exploring who we are and what defines us as a people of God. You are being built into a spiritual house, says the writer of this New Testament epistle. So here again, we see our faith explored through the lens of building. But of course, some of the perspectives have also changed in the story that Jesus tells. We are very much invited to enter the scene from the viewpoint of the builder to compare ourselves with each of these two individuals who make good and bad choices about the foundation. Well, this time it's God who is the builder. You are being built, we are told, and it's us, therefore, that is the building. But what we might also notice is that the foundation remains pretty much the same. In verse 4, Jesus is described as the living stone. And then in verse 7, we're told that the stone which the builders rejected, this living stone, has become the cornerstone. And that's actually a quote from Psalm 118. So again, we see Jesus at the foundation of this building. The words of Jesus are its foundation. And the cornerstone is that stone that kind of defines and holds together all the others. And before we think about some of the detail of that, it might do us good to just stand back and look at this as a wider narrative. You know, you could say that in these few verses, Jesus seems to pop up all over the place. He's the builder, he's the cornerstone, he's the living stone. And then we might also point out that while Jesus is described as the living stone, then just a couple of sentences later in verse five, we are described as the living stone. So if we're looking at this forensically, you might want to say, well, you know, it's a bit all over the place here. There's sort of all the images seem to be all a bit mixed up. But I think that's the point. You know, last week we heard the clear message of Jesus. If you hear my words and put them into practice, you are like someone building on a good foundation. So into this mix of cornerstones and living stones and constructed temples, you can also throw that foundation of the words of Jesus. But think about that for a minute, because I don't know about you, but I've got quite a few quotes and phrases sort of dotted around that people have given me over the years, maybe on cards or posters. And, and yeah, many of them are really quite profound and inspiring. And there are, of course, some that are pretty much universally recognised. You know, we might think of Martin Luther King's famous phrase, I have a dream or Churchill, we will fight on the beaches. Although I think most of us are then quite confused about what it was that came next. But but nonetheless, these are words that we recognise as having stood the test of time and I'm sure we can all think of plenty more and they are great words they're inspiring words and the fact that they're still repeated today means that they continue to have value but they are only words the people who uttered them are long gone and yes they may have a lasting legacy but their words are only words and as we add this image of the living stones being built into a temple, we're reminded of a very important fact. Yes, the words of Jesus are profound, life-defining and an absolute foundation to our faith. But in Jesus, we have more than just words. We have more than just a great figure in our history whose story and whose message can inspire us through being remembered and retold. Because Jesus is introduced in this second chapter of 1 Peter as a living presence. Our faith is a living relationship with Jesus. So that's why perhaps he pops up all over the place. Because we're talking about something that is organic and alive here. 
you are being built, says the writer, as you come to him. These are phrases that are very much set in the present and the future. So yeah, Jesus is a great figure from our history. But Jesus is also a very real part of our present and our future. And as we reflect on this theme rooted, what we're presented with is not simply an ideal that we are then left to aspire to in our own strength, but a God who is with us in that calling. To be rooted in Christ is to be in a living relationship. And of course, that's another of the things that roots do. It's through its roots that a tree brings all the nutrients and the moisture from the earth so that it can grow. And as it grows, then it's its roots that provide the stability for it to stand firm as its size increases. You know, we often talk about being rooted to the spot as a way of describing something that is static and fixed. But in this context, our faith is anything but static and fixed. You are being built. You are becoming because these are phrases that we see present here. God hasn't finished with us yet. We are a work in progress. And key to this, as we think about our present situation, is that God has not left us alone. God is with us in whatever present circumstances we require or present circumstances require of us. Jesus hasn't just left us with a set of instructions to get on with. We can stay rooted with God's help. We can remain rooted by allowing God to build us into this temple that is described here in the book of Peter. And so it's with that broader picture in mind that we can then perhaps look at some of the details of what he has to say. And the first thing that I would want us to draw out is, is something that we've pretty much already said. All of this happens. Everything that is being described here is a consequence of one simple phrase. As you come to him. That's why we kind of emphasised at the beginning of our service today that it matters that we come to this time of worship. So if we're going to remain rooted in our faith, then we need to be a people who intentionally come to God, who invest in that relationship with God. Now, the last nine months have thrown all of our routines completely in the air, and that will have impacted us all quite differently. You know, there are those who've said to me, Do you know, I've actually found more time to reflect on God's word and to pray. But there are others of us who haven't found that. We've already thought in our service today about the incredible pressure on some of our key workers, and you may be struggling to find the time to really seek God's presence at the moment. And perhaps some of us do find ourselves with a bit more capacity and, and maybe we need to think about how we can encourage some of those people who are really flat out at the moment to hold fast to their faith, particularly at a time when they are going to need that faith more than ever. And again, you know, things like homeschooling very much back on the agenda or having family members working from home can crowd out the space that we perhaps once had where we would deliberately seek and find opportunity to find God's presence. And then there may be others of us who are just so worried and concerned at the moment that we just don't feel that we've got the emotional capacity to seek God. And I particularly want to encourage you to make that effort. Bring those concerns to God. Don't see them as a reason to hide away from God. Come to God as you are. And then I guess that we all have to acknowledge that for many of us, our regular routines were the places where we deliberately came to God. We came to God by coming to church and coming to our home group. And, and whereas we routinely found ourselves intentionally in God's presence by simply going with the flow of church life or by being our, our, in our regular place of worship. And again, place can often matter to us. Even some of us, dare I say, sitting in our regular seat at church. We're now having to redefine that space and that time because we're in a very different context. But I think what we need to learn from what Peter says here is it's important that we come to God. And I don't say this as a sweeping generalization or pretend that for some of us, this isn't gonna present a real challenge. But I wanna suggest 
that if we are to remain rooted in our faith, we need to maintain those disciplines of intentionally seeking God's presence, of making ourselves present to God, as many would put it. And of course, that's one of the reasons that we're offering things like this online service to try and help you and support you in that. But it's something we need to invest our own selves in too. And if our routines are once again being forced to change, and if we're having to live and do things differently yet again, then perhaps one of the things we really need to do in this new year is make sure that we build into those routines, those times to seek God's presence. You know, it's great that we can celebrate that Jesus has left us with more than simply great words and a great example locked into history. But let's not miss out on the opportunity to engage with Jesus. And it's a question that each of us needs to ask and, and think, what are the implications for me of those words as we come to him? How am I going to live that out in my life in the next few months? And I sense that this journey of relationship with God and the importance of it is further underlined by the fact that this building is spoken of as a temple, a dwelling place of God. And again, I think we need to hear that. Our buildings may be closed, but God is present in those buildings because we gather in them, because God has promised to be present with his people. Our buildings are much loved, full of memories, precious and useful, but they are not an end in themselves. God becomes present through our commitment to one another, through our relating to one another. We are being built into a temple. And so again, we need to draw encouragement from that and to recognise that God's presence is here to be found, even though our circumstances are so different. And this really leads quite naturally to the second thing that I want us to draw out from this particular part of our scriptures. We are called to be living stones, but we're called to be more than that. You know, I like the fact that the Bible very often uses the same phrase or the same metaphor to describe the followers of Jesus as it does to describe Jesus himself. And of course, that's what happens here. Jesus is the living stone and then we're told that we are living stones. Because that's a reminder that we are all called to be imitators of Christ, that as individuals we are those in whom the Spirit of God resides. And the nature of Christ and the presence of Christ is something that should be visible in our lives. But while embracing all of that, these living stones, these imitators of Christ that you and I are called to be, are being built together. We are not simply called to be a group of random individuals. We are not called to be the contents on the shelf in the builder's merchant. We are being called to be built into a temple. And we have to embrace this. You know, in our online reflection this week, I'm inviting people to think about the words of Jesus. People will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another, which he spoke toward the end of John's gospel on the night he was betrayed and before he died. And the simple truth is that if we are living stones, if we are going to claim that identity in Christ, then we are being built together. If we're rooted in Christ, then we are rooted in our relationships with each other. The two are inseparable, as I said, in that reflection. And to some degree, that's how God's made us as human beings. You know, we all know the impact that human beings can have on each other, both to encourage them and to discourage them. Some of you will be aware that I am something of a fan of a particular Premier League football team. And for months now, our Premier League games have largely been happening without a crowd. And players and managers are saying right across the board, we miss the crowd. It's not the same when there aren't people in the stadium cheering us on. And for us as a people of God, this is more than just a social phenomenon. It is intrinsic to our identity. You know, those games may be happening without crowds, but the games are still going on. Goals are still being scored or, or not being scored. Points are still being gained. But you can't put up a building with only half of the materials. You can't put in the windows if you've got no walls. All of these things rely on one another. 
and the New Testament is littered with images of temples and bodies and vines with branches and so many other symbols that say to us again and again, you are called to be a community, not just a bunch of individuals. And there's a whole load of those metaphors in these few verses. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And notice that it says special possession, not God's special possessions. And if we are to remain rooted in Christ, then we need to remain rooted in our relationships with one another. And that might be as simple as picking up the phone to check on a sister or brother in Christ or sending them a card or praying for them or letting them know that you're praying for them. Or maybe even doing a little bit of shopping for the vulnerable. You know, these aren't optional extras. They're intrinsic expressions of our identity in Christ. And of course, it is a challenge. And there is a challenge to do more than that because sometimes those relationships can become strained. Sometimes we're going to see things differently to one another and we're going to need to work those things through, remembering that first and foremost, we are called to be one. We are called to love one another. And I think this is particularly important for us to remember at the moment. You know, our world has been utterly disrupted and when whatever normality might mean begins to emerge, we're going to have all kinds of different new challenges and insights to face. And we're bound to have some quite different ideas about how life should be once this particular crisis is over. And we're not all going to think the same about that. So we need to invest in our relationships. And we need to remember that we are defined not by our individual ideas and priorities, but by our common calling to be a temple worthy of the God who inhabits us. We've got to let God do the building, not try to do it on God's behalf. We've got to remember that we are all part of something more than just our own individual faith. We are called to be rooted together in Christ not just to be a group of entrenched individuals. And this is very strongly conveyed in the final sentences of today's reading. Once you were not a people, he says, but you, once you were a group of random individuals, disconnected and defined by your own interests. But now you are a people. Now you have a shared identity. And frankly, it's only through God's mercy that you have that identity. It's undeserved. So we need to live up to it. And that in turn leads us to the third dimension of this description that we're called to be a people, but we're called to be a people with a purpose. You are a priesthood, a nation. You're not your own. You're God's possession. It's God who is building the temple. So whatever plans you might have, the overriding question is, what are God's plans? What are God's purposes for this living edifice that God is crafting you and I into? And while the specifics of that might be quite distinct for our different contexts, we do have glimpses of God's purposes here. A royal priesthood. You know, priests are those who are the key connection between the community as a whole and the presence of God. And the fact that it's a royal priesthood seems to me that he's speaking here of both civic and spiritual leadership being brought together. And maybe that's part of our calling to be a prophetic voice in the midst of our societies. We're those who are called to enable people to encounter the goodness and the love of God. Those who seek to represent God to wider society. That's just a quick glimpse of some of the thoughts that are generated by one phrase, royal priesthood. And that kind of takes us back to where we began when we thought about how those rooted trees create a far broader ecosystem, holding things together so that a whole variety of species can thrive and flourish. And again, as we look at the narratives of the Old Testament, we recognise how God's purposes for his nation also reflect that. His chosen ones, his special possession, were not called to be an inward-looking, self-contained reality, but to be an example to the surrounding nations, to be a source of blessing to the whole world, to be those who gathered the nations of the world into the presence of God. 
Now, right now, that may not be an obvious possibility for us, which is why I sense that this is a season in which we need to put down our roots and to truly embed our faith and our sense of identity so that we are quit, that we're equipped for whatever the journey ahead might require. And so that we can be seen as those who are rooted in a world that I sense is going to be reeling from all that we have encountered in recent months. We need to be making ourselves ready for whatever it is God's purposes might require of us in the days and the months ahead. God is building us into a temple. God is inviting us to become those among whom his presence can be found. This is the calling in which he invites us to be rooted, to be those who are intentionally coming to him to be those who recognise that we are called to be a community together, to be those whose common life is a sign to the world of God's presence. And so may God help us to remain rooted in that vision. Mm -hmm.